дамы и господа, уважаемые коллеги. We are ready to start our round table. Can you hear me this way? Could you please uh, make it louder on all speakers? Let us uh, be louder than any other room around here because we are going to discuss a very important topic, dear colleagues. Today's roundtable discussion, or a panel of experts, whatever you call it, will be devoted to issues of protecting cultural values, legal protection of uh, cultural values in modern times. You can take these uh, receivers, please. Mm -hmm. Do you all have... Uh, anybody else needs a simultaneous interpretation device? We will talk today about the issues of legal protection of cultural values in today's world. This topic is very important. I'm not going to speak now about problems that arise with the protection of uh, immovable cultural heritage. A special panel was devoted to that. As you know, immovable cultural values is a very important topic today. Unfortunately, here the law is overruled by various terrorist challenges, as is the case with uh, ISIS, which, from my point of view, absolutely deliberately and blatantly destroys cultural monuments. But today we have conflicts related to the protection of uh, immovable cultural values because of the city planning and development of the cities for St. Petersburg. It's a very uh, well-known topic. But today, at this particular roundtable discussion, we will touch upon issues of movable cultural values. And when we say that today it is, there is a need to create legal conditions to ensure access to cultural values, uh, we are of course, first and foremost, mean that cultural values, both government-owned and non-privately owned, could be freely moved around in order to be accessible to citizens of different countries. The topic of protecting cultural values that are on loan to different countries is a very complex issue despite its seeming simplicity. In each country there is a law of its own. This is the starting point. I will give you just one example. In 19, uh, 2007 is, we had a problem with protecting an impressionist uh, exhibition and ensuring their uh, integrity in the UK, we needed to enact and amend the law on uh, bailiffs rather than having an intergovernmental agreement. Uh, one amendment to, uh, bailiff, to the law on bailiffs, we ensured uh, the security and protection from claims by third parties and for Russian museums. This is one of the most important problems, claims put forward by third parties. So this amendment to the law on bailiffs resolved the problem. And today when we speak about the protection of cultural values, we here apply not only universal uh, acts of law coming from uh, UNESCO or the United Nations, there are also legal acts that belong to the domain of national law. For example, in France they had to enact a separate law, in Germany they have uh, their own regulatory framework, 
But I will give another simple example. Until now, we haven't been regular. I mean, in Russia, we have not uh, uh, regulated our relations with our colleagues from the countries of the Commonwealth of Independent State states. We we uh, organize uh, the exhibition, say, in Kazakhstan or Belarus. We. Uh, don't have uh, yeah, I, I'm not a lawyer at all I don't understand anything it's very simple for me to speak thank you uh, uh, to, to the, uh, I'm thank, uh, very thankful that we have very uh, profound experts in the field who will be able to discuss these issues uh, in a much more competent man, way uh, than uh, it can be done by a specialist in arts or uh, in law enforcement I, I would like to give the floor to Mr. O'Connell, Rector of the London School of Economics and Political Science. They specialize in the law governing uh, cultural values. You have the floor. There is a technical idea. Since we cannot properly hear well, uh, you can use simultaneous device, interpretation devices. When you listen to Russian uh, speakers, I suggest that you all put on uh, these earphones and we will be all like aboard a submarine and it will help us. Okay, you have the floor. Anna O'Connell, uh, I'm a lawyer and lecturer at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm also an expert advisor to the UK government on applications for approval of museums and galleries under the UK's immunity from seizure law. Um, I've been asked to speak here today about the UK's immunity from seizure law uh, and to focus in particular on whether an order for the enforcement of a foreign arbitration award uh, might override the protection contained in that immunity law for objects on loan from Russian state museums. Just by way of background, uh, the UK is one of 15 countries around the world which has a specific immunity from seizure law in force uh, for cultural objects. Uh, the law was in part prompted by an incident in Switzerland back in 2005 when um, a company called Noga obtained a court order uh, in Switzerland to seize paintings which were on loan from the Pushkin Museum in Moscow um, to an exhibition in the town of Martigny in Switzerland. Noga had been involved in a long-running legal battle with the um, Russian Federation concerning loan agreements which it entered into in the early 1990s. And in 1997, Noga obtained an arbitration award in Sweden, awarding it several million dollars in damages against the Russian Federation. So it sought to seize the Pushkin paintings in order to enforce this monetary award. Um, now the seizure of the paintings in Switzerland caused a lot of controversy. Uh, museums around the world were very concerned that uh, paintings on loan to exhibitions uh, were now being used as hostages in trade disputes. Uh, and also a particular concern in this case was the fact that the paintings which were seized might be damaged because following the seizure the air conditioning in the trucks containing the paintings was turned off and there was a great fear therefore that the temperature and humidity changes might damage the art. <clears throat> Now, the Swiss government eventually cancelled the seizure order and the paintings were allowed to return to the Pushkin. Um, but this incident prompted the UK government to launch a consultation process uh, to decide whether to introduce uh, an immunity from seizure law uh, for the protection of cultural objects on loan from foreign lenders. Now, museums in the UK were strongly in support of this initiative uh, because many foreign museums were refusing to lend to its exhibitions without this legislative protection. Uh, for example, loans from museum collections in France, in Romania, in Greece and in Taiwan, they had all been refused due to the lack of an immunity from seizure law.
and it was feared that this state of affairs was placing UK museums at a serious disadvantage compared to museums in other countries where immunity from seizure laws were in force. Now, the UK had already acted, enacted uh, state immunity uh, legislation. Uh, this was enacted back in 1978. Um, but this legislation was considered to fall short of providing all lenders with the necessary protection against seizure that they required. The UK State Immunity Act uh, protects property belonging to a foreign state from the jurisdiction of the UK courts, but it doesn't protect property belonging to a separate entity of the state which is capable of suing and being sued. And it was unclear whether museums might fall into this category, um, although the UK government did say that uh, the act might be useful to Russia where the state owns its national collection. Also, the UK State Immunity Act says that property of a foreign state which is in use for commercial purposes um, is not immune from the enforcement of a judgment or an arbitration award. Again, it was unclear whether a loan to a temporary exhibition from a foreign state uh, might be considered to be a usage for commercial purposes. And lastly, of course, the, state, the UK State Immunity Act wouldn't cover property belonging to private lenders because it only obviously covers property belonging to, to state entities. Um, so in order to provide more legal certainty, uh, the UK introduced its um, immunity from seizure law and it's contained in part six of the Tribunals, Courts and Enforcement Act and it was introduced, um, as, as was said earlier, in 2007. Now, according to the UK government, uh, the Act is intended to provide the broadest possible immunity from seizure protection and to exclude any form of seizure uh, by a claimant, a creditor or law enforcement officials in civil or and criminal proceedings. So in order for an object to be protected under the UK law, several conditions need to be met. Um, firstly, only objects which are on loan to um, institutions, to museums and galleries which have been approved by the UK government are able to uh, avail of the protection afforded by the Act. This means that the, a borrowing museum has to apply to the UK government for approval. And it does this by demonstrating that it has due diligence procedures in place for checking the, uh, the provenance history and the um, uh, ownership of the objects it receives on loan. Now, so far, 27 museums and galleries around the UK have been granted approval by the UK government. Um, they include all of the big name museums in London that you would be familiar with, like uh, Tate, the National Gallery, the British Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, but also several smaller galleries in London have been approved, such as Wolverhampton Picture Gallery, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, um, and also some stately homes in the UK have also been approved. So only objects on loan to the approved institutions um, are protected under the Act. So the lender needs to ask the borrower if it's been approved, and if it has been approved, he, the lender needs to ask the borrower to seek immunity. Now the borrower does this by publishing certain information on its website concerning the object and the exhibition. And it must publish this information at least four weeks before the object enters the United Kingdom. Also, the protection only applies to objects which are normally kept outside of the UK and objects which are owned by non-UK residents. So this is under the UK's immunity law, um, only objects which are on loan from overseas are protected. And an object will only protect it while it's on temporary loan to an exhibition and for no longer than 12 months after it enters the United Kingdom. So the idea here is that it only applies to temporary as opposed to long-term loan. Now, although the Act is intended to provide the broadest possible immunity from seizure protection, um, it is subject to an exception which may override the immunity protection um, in certain circumstances. The Act says that the immunity doesn't apply if the seizure occurs under a court order uh, giving effect to a community obligation or an international treaty. Uh, so this means that the immunity doesn't apply where the UK has to comply with its obligations under European and international law.
So let me give you a few examples of where this might occur. <clears throat> well, the UK government uh, has said that an example might be uh, where a UK court is asked to enforce a foreign order for the seizure of um, or to confiscate the proceeds of crime. Um, a European law obligation would include the 1993 European Union Directive on the Return of Illegally Removed Cultural uh, Property. Uh, this directive allows a member state to request the return of an object which was illegally removed from its territory on or after the 1st of January 1993. Um, an international law obligation might include the duty to return cultural property under the 1954 Hague Convention on the protection of cultural heritage uh, during armed conflict. Um, Turning now to the question of whether the UK's immunity from seizure law would prevail over an order for the enforcement of a foreign arbitration award against cultural objects on loan from state institutions in, in Russia. Well, I'm not uh, an expert in uh, arbitration law or, the or in the enforcement procedures under the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Awards. So what follows, therefore, is my personal assessment of the legal position. Um, it was certainly the UK government's intention that an object on loan from another country would be immune uh, from seizure by a creditor of the lender. This was expressly stated in the UK's Immunity from Seizure Act. Um, it was also expressly stated in the Act's explanatory notes. And also in the consultation paper, which the UK government circulated um, prior to the enactment of the law, um, consultees were asked whether immunity from seizure protection would extend to applications for an order to enforce a foreign arbitration award, such as in the NOGA case I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. And all the consultees responded that it should. It's my view, therefore, that it was intended that the UK's immunity from seizure law would override an order for the enforcement of a foreign arbitration award against cultural objects on loan from Russian state institutions. Um, the exception contained in the Act, it merely highlights that the UK has ob obligations under European and international law which are intended to secure the return of illegally removed um, or illegally exported cultural objects. But in any event, I think that an object on loan from a Russian state museum would also be protected from the jurisdiction of the UK courts and from the enforcement of a foreign arbitration, or foreign arbitration award or judgment um, under the UK State Immunity Act. Uh, this act says that an arbitration award can only be enforced against the property of a foreign state which is in use for commercial purposes. Now, the UK delegation of the European Union's uh, working group on the mobility of collections, they made a formal submission um, a few years ago that objects on loan from foreign states to public exhibitions are treated as non-commercial goods on the basis of customary international law. The UK government has also signed, uh, although they have not yet ratified, the 2004 UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property. And this convention, although we know it's not yet in force, it codifies the rule of customary international law that cultural state property on loan and not intended for sale is immune from seizure. I think that for the avoidance of doubt on the issue, uh, the UK State Immunity Act, uh, it contains a useful legal mechanism. Um, under the Act, the head of a state's diplomatic mission, uh, they can issue a certificate to the effect that property uh, of their state is not in use for commercial purposes. And this certificate is accepted by the UK courts as sufficient evidence um, of that fact unless the contrary is proved. So in my view, it might be sensible, as sort of a belt and braces approach, uh, for Russian state museums to arrange for such a certificate to be issued in respect of any cultural objects that it sends on loan to UK institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Anna, indeed, thank you for your uh, contribution. But I think that uh, what you've been discussing, uh, 
то, о чем вы говорили. So what you talked about um, was of paramount importance, and indeed, uh, uh, when we discuss uh, the issues uh, that are so topical today, then in this sense uh, the French experience uh, is uh, quite important as well. Because when we had this uh, incident uh, with the Shukin Morozov heritage, uh, we together with the French, with the French government, developed a special piece of law because the claim back then was that um, uh, from the successes uh, 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 of uh, Shukin. So now we have a specialized piece of law uh, which um, uh, allows us uh, to exchange exhibitions uh, from many kinds of museums between Russia and uh, France. And now I give the floor to uh, Professor Barbato, Professor of Public uh, Law of the Nantes uh, a university. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank you for this opportunity and uh, I, I would uh, begin uh, my uh, presentation from a short uh, historical discourse and uh, uh, I will not be talking about the uh, 19th and 18th century where we can also trace some history but I would probably start with the early 20th uh, century. I would uh, recall here the presentation of uh, Mona Lisa in 1911 in uh, the Louvre. Two years later the painting was discovered in Venice and uh, as a sign of gratitude uh, France uh, is providing this uh, painting uh, uh, for exhibitions in Rome, Milano and Florence. Happy for France that uh, the painting was returned uh, to France, although the um, thief who stole this uh, painting from the Louvre actually was perceived as a hero in uh, France of sorts. Uh, he was a glassmaker and uh, then painting was moved to the United States uh, for a uh, temporary exhibition and we could not have imagined uh, that the painting uh, would have any problems. The painting was uh, returned to us Despite the fact that uh, back then we never had uh, any immunity laws against uh, the seizure of the objects of culture. The first of such uh, immunity laws uh, was developed uh, uh, jointly by the United States and the U Soviet Union. And I remind you the context uh, of uh, creating this law. The Richmond uh, University asked the Soviet Union uh, to have uh, a temporary exhibition of the objects of uh, art. Uh, the Soviet Union conditioned uh, such a loan show uh, by uh, very tight applications on the U.S. side uh, because uh, the Soviet Union was apprehensive of uh, any claims uh, by the successors uh, to the original uh, owners of that art. Uh, uh, such art was confiscated after the uh, revolution in the Soviet Union. So the very first law in this uh, area was the result of uh, international cooperation, I would say. 
de, de, de deux points. Je vais tout d'abord, euh, je ne vais pas revenir sur l'intérêt qu'il y a à adopter euh, des lois au Tunisie. And I would be brief because I need to be within the time limit and I would not be recalling something that you already know and I would not mention why the thing that we are discussing today is so important and why do we need to provide legal protection to any movable art. Despite the fact that uh, this is uh, a well-recognized issue internationally, we still have uh, some points to be clarified, and uh, we are talking about a conflict of interests uh, that might uh, emerge uh, uh, around the idea of providing access uh, to of various countries uh, to the objects of art, but also to protect the rights of owners uh, of such art. Here, in addition to the example that I referred to about the art confiscated during the October Revolution in the Soviet Union, we also have the issue of the uh, uh, art moved uh, to other countries uh, after the end of the World War, of the Second World War. And uh, also, after we discuss the first issue, I would like also to touch upon some uh, legal grounds and uh, legal justification for any future international legal acts that might regulate uh, the uh, relations uh, between the parties involved. After the adoption of the law that I mentioned in 1965, uh, the U.S. also adopted a, 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 an act to protect uh, cultural values. And many countries uh, adopted uh, similar laws that protect uh, cultural values uh, from seizure or arrest. In France, a similar law was adopted in, uh, in uh, 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 20 in uh, 1994 this law provides uh, for the immunity to the cultural uh, to the uh, cultural objects uh, provided there is a, a special uh, certificate uh, provided by the Ministry of Culture, which is very similar to the idea presented today by my British colleague. I should also note here the various sources and various uh, forms and formats of uh, ownership of the objects of culture uh, that are to be protected. Uh, those objects are being protected that are loaned uh, by uh, one government to uh, another government or to the institutions and agencies of that government. We, it is also important to provide immunity and protection to the cultural values uh, uh, provided out of uh, uh, personal exhibitions uh, and that is privately owned. Uh, let me give uh, 
you an example of an exhibition of uh, Bonnard, uh, which was held in Paris uh, in the Quai d'Arcy, in the Orsay Museum, uh, where a major part of that exhibition was uh, provided by uh, private uh, collectors uh, of art. As you know, the German and Austrian uh, legislations uh, provide a deeper, uh, more extensive uh, rules uh, for the protection of privately owned collections of art. And if in the French uh, legislation to provide immunity from seizure, a cultural value should be recognized not only the property of the state, but it should also be confirmed uh, that this is a cultural value, that is, it has some cultural significance. Uh, there is no such requirement in the Netherlands. In Netherlands, uh, you only need uh, uh, to state that this is a government uh, a state uh, property for that cultural uh, object to be provided such immunity and protection. We actually took a look at uh, two options uh, whereby you use uh, uh, some characteristics, whether it belongs to the state or is privately owned, uh, or whether there is uh, a specific uh, uh, certificate required, uh, but there are no uh, particular uh, laws in some of the countries. Uh, so the practice is then uh, you you would be issuing a special uh, letters or certificates uh, or museums can also conclude bilateral agreements on uh, the provision of such immunity from seizure so what are the conclusions that we can make from this uh, short uh, uh, overview of the international practices to provide immunity to the objects of art? Uh, of course, uh, we see some uh, heterogeneity at the level of national legislations. Uh, and uh, there's some distinction from the international legal acts uh, there. As I mentioned before, we also need to note not only the different approaches at the level of legislation, but also the differences in the reasons uh, for protection, that is, uh, the property of uh, the state or uh, the private, private ownership. Uh, it uh, would be such characteristics as uh, having a particular object to be recognized as a cultural value, or it might be a combination of the various characteristics. Uh, now, let us go up to the level of the European law or international law in general. And we find very few laws that can be applicable in this area, and they are weakly and suddenly used. At the level of the European or, uh, there is no single uh, law devoted to this issue. There is a law that was adopted in 1993 and it was reconsidered not long ago. It relates to the return of cultural issues rather than providing an immunity from seizure to cultural objects. At the level of the Council of Europe, there is a convention. Uh, 
l'investissement et culturel, le système est bien appartenant aux États. Et alors, sans entrer dans les détails, cette convention permet une immunité en faveur des biens appartenant aux États. Le seul problème est que... I'm talking about the Basel Convention, which was signed in Basel uh, in 1972 and was entered in force in 1986. This convention envisions the protection of cultural, uh, of cultural uh, values uh, that belong to a state. So, with this convention, the situation is not simple either because it was ratified only by eight countries. So, we can say that we have this convention has only a limited influence on regulating international issues of this nature. We already mentioned the convention, the UN convention, which was adopted on the 2nd of December 2004. This convention also is geared towards providing protection of property belonging to uh, states. It doesn't clearly define the need to, to have uh, cultural value in this, uh, that object that is uh, being uh, disputed, but this convention now plays a positive role only through the fact of its existence, because only a few countries ratified uh, it, and it hasn't yet been entered into force. En tous les cas, d'instrument efficace, d'instrument assez euh, global permettant euh, d'assurer euh, l'immunité de saisie. Having considered examples from the international experience and the European particular law, we can uh, state that there are no unified and effective instruments that would ensure integrity of cultural values. But the fact that there is uh, no clear tool set, set of tools, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we uh, are turning a blind eye at this problem. No, we are discussing it. And uh, the idea is to recognize a custom of exchange of cultural values between governments, between states. In 2005-2007, there was a project uh, in this field. Special working group groups were set up. But this work hasn't yet led to the signing of a final document. We are talking about working groups at the level of the Council of Europe and also other international organizations. Uh, the work of the International Law Association finally led to the elaboration in 2011 of recommendations on the development of an international convention that would provide legal immunity and protection from seizure to uh, cultural values moved on a temporary basis abroad. And in conclusion, I would like to propose 
a discussion here in, in order to work out a kind of a road map that would allow us to strengthen the work on uh, the development of appropriate pieces of legislation. I think we can discuss two matters, uh, legal grounds for protection. I would like also to discuss the issue of the content of these future laws from a point of view of their practical application. So th there are three types of grounds. So an object may be subject to protection uh, in the immunity from seizure in three instances. Number one, if it belongs to the state, if it has cultural value, and the combination, the third option is the combination of the above two factors. Here, I think uh, that first and foremost, we must establish the goal of this work. Is it to protect cultural values? which would help to intensify cultural exchanges and uh, compliance with international acts in this field. And here we should be guided by the universal approach to cultural heritage. Qui convient de protéger, c'est avant tout l'aspect culturel. Et donc il faut étendre les immunités de saisie non seulement aux biens appartenant aux États, mais également aux biens culturels appartenant à des particuliers. Therefore, I would like to propose to discuss the situation from the point of view of cultural exchanges, the importance to ensure access to global cultural heritage and uh, to protect cultural values guided by their uh, cultural content, cultural component rather than the form of property so that we could protect also objects contained in private collections. Uh, a similar idea on protecting cultural values per se is enshrined in many international documents and instruments. I would like to remind you of the Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Values. The convention, the UNESCO convention dating back to 2005 on diversity of cultural, uh, on, on cultural, cultural uh, diversification. The presence of this cultural dimension is also recognized by many uh, pieces of legislation of the European Union. And uh, having discussed uh, the topic of the grounds for providing protection, we started to develop uh, the content of the future law. 
we were guided by the idea that first and foremost we need to provide to protect the cultural component of the content at the same time we must be guided by the principle of universal access to cultural heritage and we have come to the conclusion that primarily we need to protect those cultural values that have been loaned not for commercial use for exhibitions, for, for example, from the point of view of ensuring access uh, to cultural heritage in educational or scholarly purposes. I think that in this way we should uh, uh, steer this discussion, first defining the grounds of protection and then discuss the methods of protection. I'm talking about the work that is currently carried out within the framework of the International Law Bar Association. In conclusion, I would like to point out some difficulties with which we, have, we are coming across. They can be of a legal and sometimes of a political nature. First and foremost, we need to think through the issue of compatibility of the future law on providing immunity to cultural values with the Directive 2014-60, uh, uh, which regulates the issues of returning those cultural values that have been illegally smuggled out of the territory of other countries. We need to ensure compatibility with convention, with the Union Droit Convention. From the political standpoint, as I have pointed out already, the attempts to adopt a convention that would be uh, that would regulate the actions of countries in this area were not adopted by a large number of countries. They've been ratified by a handful of countries only. But certain prospects uh, exist in this area, and uh, the example here is the con UNESCO Convention dating back to 2005, that was ratified by a large number of countries. So, uh, while we are waiting for the adoption of some international law convention that would govern uh, this area, museums and uh, exhibition centers can enter into bilateral relations, bilateral agreements. Uh, 
Another area here, while we are waiting for a universal international law in this case, is the development of national legislation that would provide such protection. This path was followed by France, the UK and other countries. Dear colleagues, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, the only thing I'm asking you about is, well, we don't have too much time, you know. I would like you to stick to the time allocated. About, so I think that the presentation should be limited to about 10 minutes each. I would thank you very much, Professor Barbato. I think that the topics that you have raised in your presentations are especially important. It is quite clear that today the establishment of a universal legislation that would ratified, would be ratified and legally accepted in all countries of the world, from my point of view, is extremely difficult. This is one of the very grave problems, although the way to such legislation, we need to move towards such legislation, probably. And another issue here, and I think that this uh, issue exists with the Russian legislation, uh, we, we, we will need to have a definition of what is a cultural value, an object of cultural value. Now, in our parliament, they are preparing a new law on uh, um, transporting cultural values across the Russian border uh, and the t definition of uh, cultural value is probably the most challenging thing. I will give the floor to my Russian colleagues a bit later, but since we started talking about the problems of national legislation, the United States have a rule. It's an act, actually, a legislative act. If the exchange is carried out by state entities and the exhibition is not pursuing any commercial uh, interests, it is registered with a certain with the, the State Department. And when this exhibition is included into this uh, uh, Department of State register, it is already a document that protects you. But in recent years, we have come into the following situation when, uh, after a judge from the District of Columbia, Judge Lambert, took a decision on the return on the return to the United States of a, a book collection of Rabbi Schneerson, which was never in America in, in the first place. It was always on the territory of Russia. We had to stop all the exchanges between the museums because in the opinion of uh, the lawyers from the, part, the State Department, the act that was adopted previously is not sufficient to, um, to uh, eradicate all the risks. And now the American law unilaterally also imposes fines. Fines uh, for the non implementation of the uh, decisions by American courts, and uh, we're talking about 50,000 uh, US dollars per day. So today, with the uh, Americans, we are only exchanging private collections. Uh, on the uh, not long ago, on the 13th of May, we opened such um, a private exhibition by a well-known uh, collector and uh, businessman, uh, Peter Avian, in uh, New York. Uh, a year ago, uh, American private collections uh, traveled uh, to the uh, Russian Museum in St. Petersburg and to the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. So I would say that uh, in this case, uh, the private uh, ownership uh, of the cultural uh, objects uh, would be a guarantee against seizure in the U.S. And we also have this uh, litigation about Yukos. Uh, and I'd say this litigation could have some doubtful uh, prospects, but again, we do see some uh, 
judicial actions and in this case we also have some need, need to have some uh, legal framework to be concluded and to be signed with our American partners and uh, we were developing uh, an intergovernmental agreement with the U.S., which is uh, currently on hold because we basically don't ha really have any uh, relations with the State Department uh, for the time being. But to restore our museum-to-museum uh, -museum, uh, relations uh, with the U.S., uh, we need a, a new piece of law for that, and uh, that is why um, it is my pleasure to uh, give the floor now to uh, Mr. Stephen Nurley, who represents uh, Han Loza Parks uh, here as well, but also represents here the legal advisor of the Association of the Directors uh, of Arts Museums. Mr. Nurley, the floor is yours, please. So, uh, but I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the Association of Art Museum Directors, which is over 240 directors of the major museums in North America. At the outset, I should apologize. This is a very cursory summary of a complicated issue, which I've tried to explain in a longer, more detailed paper, and I hope at some point you have the opportunity to review it. But as Professor Ravato said, the first country to enact protections for cultural objects on loan from a foreign lender was the United States. And the passage of that special protection in 1965 not only represents a first from a legislative standpoint, but also is exemplary of the special relationship that exists between the United States and Russia with respect to cultural exchange and the protection of cultural objects. The 1965 law was passed in anticipation of a proposed loan of objects from Russia to a museum in the United States, thus beginning a long, interrelated, and very positive history of protections accorded in the United States to loans of works of art to U.S. museums, but not only from Russia, but from the countries of the world. Since 1965, works of art on loan to American institutions, assuming the proper procedures have been followed, have been protected by a federal law that provides that no federal or state court may, and here I quote the statute, issue or enforce any judicial process or enter any judgment, decree, or order for the purpose or having the effect of depriving such institution, this means the borrowing institution, or any carrier of custody or control of such object. Now, while the law speaks colloquially as an immunity from seizure law, in fact, it is broader protection because it forbids the use of any judicial process that would deprive the borrowing institution of the care or custody of the loaned work of art, including arguably, for example, an order prohibiting the export of the works or an order prohibiting the exhibition of the works. There is a process that must be followed in order to be able to take advantage of the law, and that process is initiated by the borrowing institution, which makes an application to the United States Department of Justice. The borrower must be a U.S. government entity or a cultural or educational institution within the U.S. That includes private museums. There must be an agreement between the lender and the borrower, and the loan must be for temporary exhibition in the United States, and the exhibition must be administered without profit. There is, by the way, no definition of what is temporary. I should note that the protections accorded to cultural objects are not confined to those lent by foreign sovereign lenders but rather apply to any lender, whether the lender is a government, a government-owned museum, a private museum, or a private individual. After a review of the application, the Department of State determines whether the objects to be loaned are of cultural significance and whether the temporary exhibition would be in the national interest. Once made, the State Department issues a notice. Once the notice is published, the protections of the statute, which I described earlier, are firmly in place so long as the notice precedes the importation of the objects. Furthermore, the law provides that in the event there is an, any action brought against an object covered by the notice, the Attorney General of the United States has a right to intervene in the case. And very importantly, if the Attorney General is requested to do so by the borrower, the Attorney General must intervene, and in fact has done so. Virtually every month, notices with respect to exhibitions and the protections by the immunity law are published. Just as an example, the week of April 27th, 2015, saw seven exhibitions 
comprising many loans immunized under the statute. Now, notwithstanding the extraordinary number of exhibitions and cultural objects that have been covered by the law in the last 50 years, there are very few judicial decisions applying or interpreting the law. In fact, only six since 1965. In each case, the efforts of the plaintiffs to attack or execute against the artworks on loan have been summarily dismissed or voluntarily dismissed by the plaintiffs once they were apprised of the law. And like France, one of those cases was brought by the heirs of Shukin. At least three of these cases involved Russian lenders or Russian objects. Now, two relatively recent cases have raised concern in some areas. Malevich versus City of Amsterdam is one, and Agudas Hasidai Chabad of the United States versus the Russian Federation is the other. Before turning to these two cases, a brief review of the immunity accorded foreign sovereigns under United States law is necessary, and I apologize because it's a bit complex in the US. The United States follows what is known as the restrictive theory of international law. Under that theory, the United States accords immunity to foreign sovereigns and their agencies and instrumentalities when they are acting in a governmental as opposed to a private capacity. Now, the law of foreign sovereign immunity is codified in legislation known as the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, or commonly known as the FSIA. While the FSIA starts with the premise that foreign sovereigns and their property are immune from jurisdiction, there are a number of exceptions. Now, for our purposes, the most important is one known as the expropriation exception. And that exception has two prongs. The first provides that a foreign sovereign can be sued in a case involving property that the plaintiffs allege was taken in violation of international law if the property is in the United States in connection with a commercial activity carried on by the foreign state. The second prong provides that an agency or instrumentality of the foreign state can be sued in a case involving property that the plaintiffs allege was taken in violation in international law, of international law, if the property is owned by the agency or instrumentality, like a city, and the agency or instrumentality is involved in a commercial activity in the US. This prong applies even if the property at issue is not in the United States. In the Malevich case, the city of Amsterdam lent 14 works by the Russian artist Kasimir Malevich to two exhibitions in the United States. The works have been granted immunity from seizure under the statute I previously described, and just before they were ready to go back, the heirs of Kasimir Malevich filed a lawsuit. They sought damages for what they claimed was conversion. Interestingly enough, and not usually discussed, they also asked for the works back. Now, the city of Amsterdam was vigorous in its defense. They argued, amongst other things, that they weren't involved in a commercial activity at all because the loan had no profit motive, and they also cited the Immunity from Seizure Act. Now, the federal district court, which is the lowest court in the United States, by the way, in a series of decisions, determined that the court did have jurisdiction because the plaintiffs had alleged facts that, if true, fell within the expropriation exception. And the lending of works of art, they found, was a commercial activity, even though economic gain is not the goal. And this is because of a peculiar provision of the FSIA, which provides that you don't look to the purpose of a transaction, you look to the nature of its activity. Now, while this case is cause for concern, it is a decision of the lowest court level. It is not controlling precedent for any other case that might be filed. And of course, the works themselves were never subject to the jurisdiction of, court, of the court because they were protected under the Immunity from Seizure Act. And they were, in fact, returned to Amsterdam. Legislation has been introduced in the US Congress, which, if passed, would negate the effect of this decision and would specifically provide that a loan of a work of art by a foreign state or government-owned museum that has been granted immunity under the Immunity from Seizure Act is not a commercial activity for purposes of the FSIA. As a result, a plaintiff would not be able to use the presence of such a lent work in the United States as a basis for suing the foreign sovereign lender for damages. There is an exception in the proposed law 
that affects the FSIA protection. It applies only to works that come into the United States that were taken by the Nazis or their allies during the war. But to be clear, that exception itself does not impact the immunity from seizure law. The second per case is perhaps more complex, involving claims by Chabad for what is known as the library and also for the archives that Dr. Schwager has already described. This, in this particular case, Russia, the Russian State Library, and the Russian Military Library were sued by Chabad, once again citing the expropriation exception as a basis for jurisdiction. The court found that jurisdiction did exist. They ordered restitution of the library and the archive, and when the restitution order was not followed, the district court issued monetary sanctions of $50,000 per day. The plaintiffs in that case indicated that they would try to seize art of Russian museums on loan in the United States, even though they ultimately, by the way, indicated they would not do so. And I remember personally asking the lawyer how he expected to do this, to which he replied, well, we're just going to ask the court. And I said, no, no, you have to have a legal basis. And he said, well, we're just going to ask the court. So because the Immunity from Seizure Act is very specific, that no process can issue from any U.S. court for the purpose or having the effect of depriving the borrowing institution or any carrier of the object. Frankly, Chabad's threat must be viewed with great skepticism. And one of those very few cases that I indicated have been brought against objects subject to immunity under the immunity from seizure law is indicative of how U.S. courts are supposed to and would presumably act in the event of an attempt to execute on a money judgment arising out of the contempt order. In Magnus versus Russian Federation, the plaintiffs who had recovered a judgment for an excess of $234 million sought to recover on the judgment against works of art on loan from Russia. The basis for jurisdiction in the case was the same expropriation exception that was used in Malevich and in Chabad. The Attorney General of the United States intervened in the case as he is supposed to do. He invoked the Immunity from Seizure Act and the Fort Court found, let me quote, that the items upon which plaintiffs seek to execute are immune from execution. If the Chabad plaintiffs were ever to attempt to execute against works of art on loan that have been granted immunity under the Immunity from Seizure Act, in my opinion at least, the result should be no different. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions as appropriate. And uh, as I say, this is a very, very fast summary over a very difficult subject. And for us especially because uh, it is especially it, 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 it is especially interesting for us uh, because uh, as you understand uh, our uh, current uh, relationships with the American museum world um, are very much complicated and uh, I think that uh, the meeting in Boston which will be which, which is going to take place in, in June, in the end of month. Eh? Are we going to have it or not? It is not going to take place in June, but not in June, but later. But anyways, uh, a meeting that we are planning uh, to have uh, with the Getty Foundation, uh, again, to think over all these issues uh, and the legal aspects as well, um, is very important. And, uh, I think that um, the uh, protection mechanisms uh, in the United States uh, are quite uh, broad and comprehensive, and we may probably think about going back to develop uh, an intergovernmental uh, agreement uh, which would not require ratification, uh, one of the fundamental challenges there. So an intergovernmental uh, agreement uh, would be uh, instrumental uh, to both uh, sides, especially in light of those uh, examples that uh, uh, Professor Barbato um, highlighted. Perhaps I would ask uh, our colleague uh, 
from the international uh, law department of the uh, Russian Justice University, Vasilisa Neshatawa, to say a few words about this. Indeed, good afternoon, my dear colleagues. I try to be brief um, and not to take much of your time here. I totally agree with the previous speakers in that uh, this is uh, a very complex uh, field that uh, we are working in because we, uh, on a daily basis, are trying to find a balance between uh, public and private interests because we always face uh, the issue whether we protect uh, the uh, public interest, uh, the government interest, and the right to uh, access uh, cultural heritage uh, for the country, or whether we are trying to somehow take into account uh, the interests of a private own um, of a cultural of a work of art. And uh, as Professor Barbata mentioned, uh, there are three obvious uh, things: uh, inadequate international uh, regulation in the area of this of private law especially second uh, inadequate uh, and very diverse national legislation as regards uh, the immunity protection of uh, some special uh, objects like works of art and the third the lack uh, what is important uh, a supranational mechanism of dispute resolution as um, a measure of uh, law enforcement uh, for the uh, first uh, two things. Uh, undoubtedly, here in the domain of uh, immunity, we face uh, several uh, important aspects, uh, immunity against uh, jurisdiction and immunity against uh, forceful measures uh, or enforcement. Uh, let me remind you that undoubtedly in in this, uh, the correlation between uh, the action uh, to return cultural values uh, and immunity, we face the same challenge because on the one hand we have the 1970-1995 conventions as uh, international legislations uh, where we have the general provisions uh, for the restitution, but in the 1995 convention in Article 13 there is also a general provision that it gives priority to other uh, international uh, documents in this uh, particular area. So when we come to discuss uh, an immunity, interna an international immunity convention, uh, perhaps we need to remember that we might have a coll collision of law here. Apart from that, in this convention, as we know, there is uh, no provision about immunity for cultural values, and therefore we are own, we can only use the UN Convention 2004 as a general legal norm. And uh, in what refers to jurisdictional immunity, we have two negative aspects there. That is uh, the exception based on uh, uh, the commercial nature of activity, which Ms. Professor Nelly referred to, and uh, another exception related to the cases of expropriation. So. Lawyers uh, made all sorts of errors. They were trying to uh, say that we are, it is done in a cultural interest, uh, and in the U.S. courts, this idea, the purpose of the na of the activity, was uh, overruled because uh, what is important is the nature of this uh, cultural value or an exhibition or whatever. Enforcement measures. National regulation is not uh, is not standing still. It is developing further. So we have three main grounds there. That is uh, breach of contractual obligations, the Norga case, the Ak human concern against the Czech Republic. They were thankfully resolved in the favor of the state in both cases. Uh, gross violations of human rights especially in the course of military conflicts.
here we can uh, remind Italian cases um, Ferini against Germany and the number of subsequent cases and the solution uh, the decision of the International Court about against uh, Germany uh, well so this uh, case law is not uh, quite uh, um, the case law is not entirely certain, so uh, protection of human rights seems to be to overrule the immunity of cultural values. And the third situation is the situation of expropriation, the uh, Malevich case, the Habad against Russia case, which we referred to earlier. And the building in the previous presentations, I would like to say what we shall do in this case. Well, on the one hand, we have to use the existing mechanisms which have already been elaborated comfort letters or some other guarantees that are provided by governments but this is not enough of course in integration of special norms in uh, national legislation which don't exist in many countries even of the European Union for example in the EU, maybe um, my colleague will correct me, there were attempts to unify the situation. Mobility for Collection Initiative was launched when they analyzed existing pieces of uh, regulation in this field. Uh, well, what they found that there was uh, diversity of approaches, different criteria were applied. So a certain report was prepared by the working group, but uh, no final result was reached. Well, they didn't even reach a consensus whether they should develop a model law for the entire EU or they should introduce conventional mechanisms. Thirdly, in Russia we also have a general uh, norm um, on in the law on the transportation of various things across the border, but there, this is not enough to effectively regulate. We need to create international, mm, uh, an international body that would regulate or the settled disputes, which Mr. Brabato was talking about. He, so there is a recommendation uh, that has led to the development of a draft convention dealing with immunity granted to cultural values against uh, claims by third parties and uh, in law enforcement measures. But this it is good that this convention was prepared. It was uh, 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 handed over to UNESCO to, in 2014 and uh, what happened later we don't know. We know that there is, well, the collaboration between international organizations is a rather lengthy process, but if we even take a look at the convention, the text of the language there, it has a lot of controversies there. There is a collision norm. The convention, uh, again, is uh, gives priority to all other international regulations or obligations, what Anne was referring to, and we will have another collision of international pieces of legislation. And the fourth issue that I mentioned already, it is very important that any mechanism that would be put in place is uh, supported with an appropriate judicial mechanism. For example, in this draft convention, the developers of the text they uh, used the jurisdiction of international court of the United Nations. I think that this is not enough. We need to create a special judicial mechanism for protection of a supranational law would be an idealistic, I think, an idealistic uh, approach, but uh, we need to have uh, to inst inst institute specialist uh, specialist mechanisms of dispute settlement. Uh, there are some examples, the Kyoto Convention, for example. They, there is a procedure whereby they can uh, apply with complaints to the uh, arbitration. Well, this is a way. 
forward. I think it is great that today we are outlining the issues that are on the agenda in terms of protecting cultural values. It is imp important to give the impetus to this process. We, at our different levels, should all uh, try and forward this initiative. I, I would, I'm very thankful to the association, the International Bar Law Association that they have developed this document. It would be great that Russia, the US, uh, the UK, other countries would uh, take part in subsequent steps. And I think that all of this will lead to success and uh, we will be able to solve these problems in the future. Thank you very much, Vasilisa. What you are talking is, of course, important. And it seems evident to me that today we are lacking, sometimes, paradoxically, though it may seem, specialist organizations. The United Nations, the European Union, the Council of Europe, which try to work out some approach to these problems, they are not enough, but they are not sufficient. I think one could create a permanent round table, if you wish, maybe under the auspices of the St. Petersburg Legal Law Forum or some other format where lawyers, uh, outstanding lawyers like you, from various countries who are interested in this universal legislation could discuss this issue. We need to do some work on an ongoing basis. I think for our organizations this topic is not the most important. But we live in a world today where we are forced very often to adopt laws about one single exhibition. When we had an exhibition, a collection from Kremlin museums in the Czech Republic, in the Czech Republic they adopted a law on that particular exhibition that provided immunity, all sorts of immunities, only for this exhibition. It is not a legal precedent. It doesn't mean that the next exhibition from Russia will have a similar level of protection. It was a law on a single exhibition. And now, on the one hand, we're talking about universal legislation, and the real practices tell us that when we come across a specific case, it is very difficult. We come across legal difficulties. And I would like to give the floor to Anastasia Savitskaya, a lawyer of our uh, um, bar, um, uh, uh, thank you very much, organi organizers, for giving me the opportunity to, to take part in this roundtable discussion. The topic of my presentation is especially relevant for Russia now. I don't know whether you are aware of this um, uh, his story in Europe. Uh, it is called the case of Scythian gold. Briefly, for those who don't know, I would like to say that in 2013, four Crimean museums in uh, Kerch, in uh, Bakhchisarai, Gersanes, they sent to Germany and then to the Netherlands their best works, their best objects of art, mainly of archaeological nature. We call it Scythian gold, but apart from gold and uh, gold things, the gold decorations, there were all sorts of uh, archaeological finds uh, dating back to when the Crimea was Greek and Roman and was Scythian. There are such objects as the symbol of the city of Kerch, uh, the uh, snake-legged goddess. For Crimean museums, this was the first exhibition of this kind, but they collected all the best things and sent to Europe for the first time. And nobody could imagine that the situation would change so drastically. When the exhibition left, it was from Ukraine, Ukraine, and in March 2014, in Crimea, we had a referendum. We signed an agreement on reunification with the Russian Federation. 
and the dilem dilemma emerged. For Crimean museums, it was absolutely clear that they were certain that they should be returned to those museums, but Ukraine thought that those objects should be returned to Kiev. Uh, Ukraine made very serious amendments uh, on their own uh, museum legislation that totally changed uh, the approaches to protecting museum rights. Uh, they also adopted certain bylaws on the transfer of certain museums, Crimean Museum to the National Museum in uh, Kiev, the National Museum of History of Ukraine. A lot has been said about the protection of go government entities. People said that probably we don't have enough level of protection for private owners of whatever cultural objects. And I would like to develop on the protection of uh, cultural institutions such as museums who are also uh, subjects of law, those entities that enter into agreements on exhibitions where people work who dedicate their life to the study of those objects of art. We're talking about museum not, not as, a building, as buildings, but as centers of knowledge where constant workers go going on. And since those museums are archaeological, they are inseparably linked to the history of the land where those archaeological finds were made in the first place. Well, first of all, I would like to point out that for about a year we've been working in this area and throughout this year we uh, worked in confidentiality conditions. We asked museums also to give a few comments on this topic. And today, for the first time, we decided to raise certain issues here at an international forum in St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, Probably I won't be able to um, analyze international legal norms very thoroughly because now the story is in court and we cannot disclose the position of one of the parties which have to get disclosed in the court of law. I'm not going to do that. But we can uh, say something already today. I would like to say how this uh, story evolved. It was especially difficult in the first several months when we were at a loss what was what will happen if we take the legal side of the things the exhibition was given to the museum of Alan Pearson which is part of the Amsterdam U University based on the contracts that were signed directly with four Crimean based museums those museums are parties to the contract and not the state Subsequently, when the exhibition was uh, nearing its closure, the Ukraine has, uh, had already sent appropriate notes to the Netherlands and they asked to send everything immediately to Kiev. And now, in the course of the court proceedings, we knew that in May 2014, um, the Amsterdam Museum agreed to send over all the exhibits to Kiev. We didn't know that. And uh, we went to Amsterdam maybe because of our visit, the position of the uh, Dutch Museum changed. Maybe Ukraine was not insistent enough because they had to provide guarantees of compensating whatever damage to uh, Crimean museums and to pay for the transportation of those exhibits to Kiev. But the fact remains the fact they never left for Kiev. Kiev had prepared documents on uh, on extending the term of this um, exhibition, but not in conjunction with Crimean Museum, but with the National Museum of he uh, his Ukrainian History. But that nothing was signed to that effect. So uh, the. Uh, the exhibition was extended 
in accordance with the contracts with Crimean Museum, but without appropriate consensus from the uh, Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. So in several months, the Museum of Alan Pearson said that they cannot take a decision on the fate of these exhibits, and Desire said that uh, we'd prefer to take this case to the Court of Law. So we found ourselves in a situation where we didn't have anything to do. Either go to the court or wait for things to resolve themselves somehow. And then the question of jurisdiction arose. This Pearson Museum undertook uh, the maintenance, insurance and storage of these exhibits. Of course there were no measures of compensatory nature. Those exhibits were kind of blocked after the exhibition for an indefinite period of time until the situation is resolved in a court of law. And uh, here, an important question for the museum community is, what shall we do? What kind of uh, court should have jurisdiction over contracts on exhibitions? So here, the competent court was the International uh, international uh, Arbitration Court in Kiev, Ukraine. It is arbitration, so it is independent, but there were certain risks related to the fact that we go to court in Kiev. It's difficult to get there in the first place from the Crimea, from Russia, and we didn't know what kind of pressure may be exerted there, but we were prepared to discuss the idea of uh, having an arbitration there. We could select the arbiter from Europe, for example, but the arbiter should be, the arbitrator is one. And Alan Pearson said that they are not going to sign any additional agreements or nor change the contract. You have now a proposal to change the location of arbitration to Amsterdam, for example, who were not accepted by the museum. And uh, there were concerns that even if we agree to uh, the arbitration in Kyiv, but we cannot agree on an arbiter, then uh, the arbiter would be selected for us, and we thought it would be a very high risk, and we decided that uh, we would initiate ourselves uh, um, a case and uh, would uh, refer it uh, to the uh, state court of the Netherlands, so that they would uh, uh, really decide on the uh, involvement of the state and museums. Uh, I should say that the uh, uh, positions of the Netherlands and uh, the Russian Federation are quite uh, interesting there. None of the parties actually assumed any uh, kind of position before that case went to court. Uh, the Netherlands, in the person of the foreign ministry, said that this is a dispute uh, between the museums and we are not going to be involved. The same position was held by the Russian Federation. Although the position of the Netherlands uh, changed after the case actually went uh, uh, to court. Uh, after that, uh, uh, quite expectedly, uh, Ukraine uh, filed uh, an action. Uh, and the Netherlands, uh, we also received a. a an action, and interestingly, the Netherlands, on the uh, hand, uh, uh, reason that they need to be involved because um, maybe sometime in the future they might have some uh, obligations to Ukraine if such items of art would go back to uh, the Crimea. And interestingly, the position of the Court of Amsterdam uh, was that uh, they agreed with our vision of that dispute uh, and refused used uh, to take the Netherlands as uh, one of the sides uh, to the uh, court, to, to the uh, case. But Ukraine is uh, there, and so the uh, defendant uh, would be uh, the Allard Pearson Museum, and the uh, natives would be the Crimean Museums, and then there would be also some uh, broad action filed by Ukraine, as we expect. Uh, so these are the challenges when we uh, that we face when uh, in uh, this case. Uh, uh, noteworthy, uh, the position of the Allard Pearson uh, Museum 
Museum, as an institution of uh, culture, uh, it is clear they did not uh, uh, sign any agreements with us, uh, but uh, when the uh, case went to court, uh, the museum actually never had any objections against that because uh, they didn't want probably to have this litigation held uh, in uh, Kiev. In the future, if I were asked uh, what would be the right way to sign such contracts, I would uh, say and advise uh, not to be limited by just one arbiter as uh, uh, we were had in this uh, case. Uh, and also, uh, of course, it would be good to have uh, a court of arbitration involved, but a court uh, that uh, would uh, take into account uh, the interests of uh, museums and uh, cultural establishments. As Vasilisa mentioned, perhaps it would be wise uh, to have uh, such a specialized uh, uh, court. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, with uh, the appropriate authority and powers, uh, perhaps to be reflected in uh, uh, some specialized conventions in the future. We already discussed some of those conventions, but when we talk about uh, the protection of the works of art, uh, we seem to mean that we are protecting some uh, public property, uh, governmental property. But uh, talk about, say, the uh, rights of nations, say, uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, uh, populations. Uh, but take, for example, a referendum in Scotland or in uh, Catalonia in Spain. Let us assume that those uh, territories which are currently part of uh, one country would uh, uh, separate. Uh, now it would be kind of like strange to imagine that uh, the government of Great Britain as the owner of uh, uh, those works of art in uh, Scotland would say goodbye Scotland but I'll take back all those works of art from the Scottish Museum. It would be strange I mean of course this is a, um, a purely hypothesis and uh, the Crimean situation is, is, more, is a more contentious uh, issue but uh, the principle of a work of art to be following the destiny of a state uh, is quite uh, debatable. Now, when we are talking about uh, archaeological finds, uh, uh, we probably need to talk about the uh, the whole of a museum collection. And this is something that uh, is already recognized. People are saying that uh, we need to also to maintain cultural values in the territories uh, with which those cultural values are immediately related. Uh, and uh, like the tragedy of those exhibition coordinators or owners uh, uh, if uh, uh, something happens uh, uh, to uh, those uh, exhibitions on loan. Uh, well, the Crimean museums are currently uh, in, uh, in, in, in a situation when they have the financing and their collections are preserved, but uh, uh, the coordinator of that exhibition on loan says, that I'm shameful because I, uh, those uh, works of art uh, I, uh, are perceived to be lost or at least not returned on time. So uh, we are talking about uh, the protection of the uh, rights of uh, con countries and governments, but not of museums. But we also asked ourselves the question of the Rurik Pact uh, or the uh, protection of the institution serving the goals of uh, science uh, and art. Uh, and uh, that document was signed in 1935, and it's called the Rurik Pact. And uh, to a large extent, uh, uh, at least more than uh, today's conversions, it is focused on uh, the preservation and immunity of uh, works of art and cultural values, uh, but not uh, necessarily bound uh, by the uh, particular territories or countries, but uh, cultural institutions should be protected uh, regardless of uh, which territory or state uh, 
uh, this cultural establishment uh, belongs to and it would be good if such uh, institute uh, institutes of uh, our culture would be protected universally well conventions are signed by state so it would be hard to put such ideas into a uh, governmental or into an international convention and states of course would prefer to protect their own interests uh, rather than the interests of uh, say um, cultural establishments uh, but the uh, um, code of uh, museum ethics actually directly says that any disputes uh, should be resolved in line with uh, academic and humanitarian principles and, and only then do we come to take into account the legal aspects but that code of museum ethics also says that uh, the interests of um, a museum should prevail the code uh, directly says that to extract uh, a work of art from a museum without the consent of the principal or director of such museum is impossible. But take the practice of Ukraine, uh, which tried to ch change its own legislation specifically for that skithing gold case. Like in Russia and Ukraine, uh, you could not really uh, take uh, exhibits from one museum to another museum without the consent uh, of uh, that uh, particular museum. Uh, it was not suffice to have only, say, the uh, consent of the Ministry of Culture. So, uh, in Ukraine before, you also had to have uh, the application uh, from uh, a uh, supervisor of a museum uh, from the Ministry of Culture, and only then could you take uh, exhibits uh, between the museums uh, for permanent uh, collections. Uh, now, the legislation today in Ukraine is that uh, it is uh, enough to have uh, only the decision of the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine uh, for doing so. And we cannot uh, contest this in court because this is a purely national legislation of Ukraine. Perhaps here I will stop because I don't want to dwell upon uh, all those uh, specifics uh, of uh, museum to museum relations. But when the case is over with the skiffing gold, we may want to share this with you later. Well, thank you. Indeed, I think that this is quite uh, a complex uh, subject as to how to relate corporate ethics and uh, legislation. This conflict of interest, uh, this uh, collision between corporate ethics uh, and legislation is not only about uh, the uh, cultural establishments or institutions, uh, but to uh, in, uh, many other. But think about the hermitage, uh, which would uh, probably declare itself uh, an independent state and would try to somehow separate from the Russian Federation. Think about the collision of law there. Say the hermitage uh, leaves the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation. Well, Anyway, such a uh, hypothesis. Uh, let me give the floor to Marina Tsegulov, uh, head of uh, the legal service of the Hermitage, uh, for her comments. Uh, let me assure you that we are not going to leave the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation uh, uh, taking all our belongings uh, with us. Uh, but let me draw your attention uh, to the following. Indeed, uh, we are talking about um, um, a very high legal uncertainty for any big museum. Uh, the Hermitage um, really uh, takes uh, some uh, loan shows and uh, loan exhibitions, but we also issue exhibits for loan to other museums and uh, of course uh, we're talking about some mutual guarantees uh, for such uh, loan exhibitions uh, perhaps i would not really focus on uh, some international specialized legislation there because it was broadly discussed by the previous speakers but uh, statistically only 15 countries uh, have specialized laws and legislations uh, in terms of the uh, immunity against the seizure of the works of art. Uh, an interesting fact, uh, in a number of countries, and we heard that uh, from uh, the previous speakers, the, some specialized uh, 
exit uh, laws uh, uh, were adopted uh, in relation to exhibitions uh, from Russia, not only from the Hermitage. Uh, same in France, uh, uh, a law of 94 was uh, adopted because of the Hermitage uh, uh, exhibition in the Pompidou Center, Germany. Uh, following uh, uh, France also adopted uh, its own legislation on immunity be because of the exhibitions uh, uh, from Russia, Switzerland as well, and Great Britain uh, again, also all related uh, to the Russian exhibitions, so uh, in, particular case, in that particular case of the Hermitage exhibition. We are of course happy that people appreciate the high cultural value of our uh, works of art, and many museums would like to display those works of art uh, in them collections. Um, that is why there is uh, this high demand uh, for this uh, uh, world cultural heritage uh, that the Hermitage um, has. Now, in terms of our own legislation in this area, uh, Vasilisa spoke about that. Indeed, we have only one uh, provision, Article 35, uh, of the existing uh, law on the import and export of the works of art, uh, and uh, it seemingly has no relation to immunity. Actually, the article uh, speaks about the uh, temporary taking out and uh, bringing in the works of art. Uh, so you might think that this is, has no relation to immunity. Indeed, there is no mention of uh, immunity against seizure, uh, but there is uh, some uh, definition uh, there, which is very unclear, and uh, this is a definition of a, uh, uh, or a term, rather, of uh, government uh, protection. What protection? Would it be the police? Would it be some other form of protection? We no, don't know. But we actually kind of like agreed between ourselves that this is about immunity. So this protection from the state would be provided to exhibitions coming into Russia. And if Russia signs an international, if uh, Russia signs international agreements and that there is a resolution of the government, but there is nothing in place yet there. So there is some legal uncertainty about uh, the loan exhibitions coming into Russia. But even with this uh, legal vacuum, there have been no precedents in Russia when the works of art would have been uh, placed under the jurisdiction of a Russian court or uh, seized. Uh, the guarantees are issued by the Ministry of Culture. They are of declarative nature, of course, and they rely, uh, do not rely on any uh, legal provisions. Uh, but in practice, uh, this is basically a gentleman's accord, uh, and they create a specialized regime, a regime uh, which is good good for customs uh, when, uh, say, boxes with the exhibits uh, would not be opened, because uh, based on Article 35, uh, the Ministry of Culture issues uh, such uh, uh, a certificate to customs. Uh, Russia did not ratify but signed the, the convention that was mentioned uh, here before, the convention of 2004, which has not been yet uh, put into force because there are no, not uh, 35 countries yet uh, not ratified it. Uh, we say that we re recognize the principle of uh, uh, state uh, sovereignty, but again, this is basically a goodwill principle which uh, we are trying to pursue in civil law. We understand that uh, uh, international law would be preferable, but of course, uh, the indeed, um, in Congress and in the Russian Parliament, uh, uh, legislation is being now reviewed, or legislative provisions are being reviewed, as we discussed with uh, my colleague uh, Sinelli. Before this, uh, 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 
uh, legislation about uh, immunity and uh, other uh, measures. Uh, in our case, this would be a new version of this uh, uh, law on the uh, import and export uh, of uh, the works of art. We actually came up with a number of uh, very essential uh, proposals uh, for the law that might uh, somehow put this whole situation in order. And I'm going to really take on any additional authority, but in uh, preparing our proposals, we used extensively the German legislation, uh, the Article 20 of the 1995 uh, law on the protection of the expropriation of the works of art. So basically, we rever reworked uh, and uh, uh, assumed uh, some of the provisions of that uh, law, and um, I don't think that this is very unusual when we can implement uh, some uh, legal provisions of uh, one country into uh, the legislation of another country. I don't want to really make you very tired, so I'll follow the example of uh, Prime Minister Medvedev, who raised his eyes and saw the good uh, uh, weather and said, I would not really uh, uh, keep you any longer here. So I would be very brief in conclusion, and I would uh, mention some of the things that we really think should be included in that new Article 35. We think that uh, if the changes uh, that would be made to the law, the main uh, principles there would be that we uh, at least have an element of legislation that would uh, be providing immunity to the works of art. So, uh, the, we talked about uh, some uh, legal obstacles, but uh, is there a solution to such obstacle? obstacles and the solution is that uh, of course uh, if uh, globally speaking uh, the uh, partners uh, adhere to the uh, principles of uh, immunity then even if uh, countries do not have a specialized piece of law on immunity it would not be an obstacle uh, to cultural exchanges on the contrary, if a country would not recognize uh, uh, the state sovereignty, it uh, might be dangerous um, and harmful for the exchanges. Uh, as Vasilisa mentioned, uh, key points to tie, thinking about this uh, legal uncertainty, uh, both internationally and nationally, uh, in terms of our uh, legislation, and uh, the absence of uh, such legislation in Russia, I think that uh, the following principle could be good. Uh, we may recognize uh, the uh, principle of uh, state uh, uh, sovereignty, uh, provision of immunity under uh, the legislation of a specific country, and also uh, the presentation of the letters of comfort uh, when uh, the legislation of the recipient country would not provide immunity from seizure, but would guarantee the timely return of the works of art uh, after the completion of uh, a loan exhibition. If all of this uh, would uh, be observed, then of course, uh, at least it would be some comfort to us that can, we can use. Thank you very much, Marina. I think that the discussion that has come to an end, we will probably ask uh, the people in the floor if they have any questions to ask. I think the materials of this discussion, it would be a good idea to send to uh, the Parliament of Russia, to their committee, culture, committee of Cult and Culture, to our Russian Parliament. And I would like uh, the organizers uh, to, ask, to ask the organizers to send the materials of our discussion to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation, to the Ministry of Culture, because those issues that we have raised here are very significant. In 1994, when we, for the first time after the collapse of the Soviet Union, held an exhibition in Kazakhstan, and I was Deputy Minister of, Minister of Culture that, in those days, I asked my 
Kazakhstani colleagues to give me a kind of government guarantee from the Ministry of Finance, for example. We were organizing exhibitions of uh, masterpieces from the Tretyakov Gallery. We are not going to give you Ministry of Finance guarantees, they told me. We will give you a guarantee from the Ministry of the Interior. I said, OK, OK. That was a total legal vacuum. OK, the Ministry of the Interior, that is the police, will uh, will be just fine. Then the capital of the country was still in Almaty, and when we arrived there, we organized the exhibition. Those were masterpieces, absolute masterpieces. And I was saying, how will you guarantee the integrity? Uh, and they say, everything's very simple. Uh, and there came uh, well, uh, uh, a detachment of troops with machine guns, and they put a soldier next to each of the masterpiece, uh, and this was the guarantee from the Ministry of the Interior. I told them just that that's the state protection, yes, in the best sense of the word. I told them to remove those guys because they will damage the works of art with their machine guns. Um, so I remember this story until this day, but uh, today we are going to have uh, 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 we'll have a lot of cultural exchanges with Greece and they require additional guarantees because they are bringing uh, parts of their national heritage. So this discussion is extremely useful. I am thankful to all the panelists, all the speakers and those who listened. This was, uh, well, if the, we have any questions from the floor, I think my colleagues at the table will be able to take them. Any questions anywhere? colleagues. Oh, I will just repeat the words of our Prime Minister, that the science is shining. Please introduce yourself. Dmitry Bazin. I have a question to Anastasia Savitska. When you put your uh, claim, or um, rather, yes, uh, well, 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 do, 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 well, did you consider the possibility that your um, uh, uh, if your action will not be uh, taken by the court? Well, everyone who goes to court is prepared that his case will be uh, will be uh, rejected, or if, or even if you are sure that your position is right by 99%. But in our situation, we have this political repercussions, and of course, we take into account all the risks. But uh, we decided that instead of waiting when Ukraine goes to court, we st instead of waiting for that, we decided to go to court ourselves. If you're asking, well, the plan that we have, I won't be able to tell you at this point. We, we don't have claims from Ukraine. We ca I cannot uh, disclose the legal position and the plans for the future in regard of this case. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No questions? You won't accuse me of uh, trampling on democracy in the Russian Federation. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, speakers, dear speakers. Bon appétit and have a nice day. Thank you.